So this lecture um, is kind of um, following the Head Start lecture. So whereas Head Start was dealing with childhood poverty, Social Security is dealing with poverty among the elderly, which um, Social Security program starts in the 1930s. So it's a little bit, um, it's a little bit longer lasting. But what is um, meaningful about it is the way that it has effectively, just by providing money, has um, reduced elderly poverty. So obviously that's different than the way that um, Head Start reduces poverty, right? Head Start reduces poverty not by giving money, but rather by providing the opportunity. Um, this, Social Security, is really public insurance. We all, as workers, pay into the system, and it covers us um, if um, something bad happens to us, but it also covers us um, if, um, you know, um, it also covers us when we become uh, old. Okay. So let's start here. And it starts um, in 1935 um, under the New Deal. And when you're talking about saving for retirement, the, the metaphor that's been used ever since the Social Security program started was the three-legged stool. Social Security, this is important, Social Security was never designed to be on its own the thing that an old person relies on for income. Yet... Sadly, that is what has become the case. Um, uh, especially for the poor, where they don't have individual savings. They weren't able to save for retirement actively, and they didn't work for a company where um, a pension was provided. So as the example of now that you found a little bit more about my family from the Head Start program, um, you know, both my parents are now retired and rely almost exclusively on Social Security. Um, you know, it it at least provides enough money that you um, can survive, uh, but you're certainly not thriving um, based on that. Um, don't worry, we'll get another video with this one as well. Um, Social Security is um, like in other developed countries that have a rather similar program. It's generally set up uh, with a pay-as-you-go system called PAYGO, basically, in that my contributions as a current worker are being put into the pool of funds that current retirees are drawing from. So there's no account called Shiting, Tom Shiting, where my contributions are going into and that I then draw upon them when I retire. Not at all. Um, yes, Social Security measures um, how many credits I have. And the way that a credit works is that you earn a credit based on um, having earned a certain amount um, every um, three months of the year. And so every year you can earn up to four quarters and you need 40 quarters to be eligible for Social Security. So you have to have a work history of at least 10 years. Now, the reason why it's set up that way is that you can have individuals have to be out of the workplace seasonally, um, temporarily because of childcare, that kind of thing. And those individuals could still be earning quarters. But for a normal you know, individual who's working part-time or full-time um, every year, you would earn a max of four credits a year, and you have to have 40 credits to be able to um, retire. Um, this is not a um, fully funded system, meaning that we had years where Social Security had too much money because there were too many workers compared to retirees. Now we're in the opposite situation most recently where there's more retirees than there are workers. And so now Social Security is drawing down on its trust fund. And it's built up over time. 
Um, that trust fund was set up in again in 1982, which was the last time that the Social Security program was revised. I'll repeat that again. The last time the Social Security program was revised was 1982. That was the last time that retirement ages were revised. It's just such a For politicians, it's just you don't want to mess with it in any way, shape, or form. So they just kind of leave it as it is. So unfortunately, the last time it was really dealt with was 1982. Um, Social Security today, with having that trust fund, it is a hybrid of pay-as-you-go and fully funded. So it was pay-as-you-go um, until recently. And now with the trust fund being drawn down upon, um, you know, it's using that trust fund to keep paying out the benefits. The problem is that the um, the trust fund is going to become exhausted pretty quickly because we have this baby boom generation that is currently um, retiring every year. Um, and it's a pretty it's a pretty big group. That's why it's called the baby boom generation. It's a pretty big group that's all drawing on Social Security, um, and so that's um, obviously complicating the funding issue. The way that it's paid for is with taxes. You and I all pay for it. It's not some government welfare program or or anything like that. You and I all pay um, six point two percent of our income into Social Security. Our employer pays the exact same amount, 6.2%. And so those amounts together, um, those amounts together go into the trust fund. Um, not all work is covered under Social Security. So as one example, um, some government employees, not myself, but for some government employees, they are not part of the social security system. I have a friend who's a public school teacher in Illinois. They don't, they're not part of the social security system. Um, it sucks. Um, when I teach more classes for UH, than is in my contract. I also am not paying um, Social Security taxes. It's not necessarily a good thing because the way that Social Security works then to determine your amount that you're going to get as a benefit is that they look at how much your income was over time with the idea that Social Security is going to um, try to achieve a certain replacement rate, meaning it's replacing a certain amount of your income um, once you retire. The poorer you are, the higher the replacement rate is because the idea is that you might not have access to um, private savings or a pension. So um, the retirement age for you and I, or basically in the same generation, unless you're a very old student in this class, um, we can apply for um, Social Security as early as age 62. You'll get a reduced benefit, though, because you're basically applying for it early. Full retirement age for all of us is 67 in a few months. I don't remember exactly what it is. I think it's 67 and... Seven and ten months, I think. I just yeah. So earliest is sixty-two. I guess just sixty-seven. So no months, just sixty-seven. And then generally speaking, you need uh, um, if you delay it after age sixty-seven, then you get eight percent more per month that you delay it. Um. Not that you care about what my parents did, but my father retired first. His job was a little bit more taxing on the body. So he retired at age 62. 
And so because he retired at age 62, um, you know, he removed himself from the labor force at that point. Um, my mother didn't stop working until last year, and she's actually applying for Social Security for the first time next month. She just turned 70, and so she'll be getting the maximum amount, essentially. Um, now, the way she was able to do that was because, you know, they both lived on, um, you know, one Social Security check, my father's. Now that they have both, things are probably going to be a little bit easier. Um, for that one paycheck, it was about, um, for my father's, it's about $1,500 a month. Again, you're not, you're going to, you know, for if you're retired, your expense levels aren't that high, but you can certainly get a sense that you're not that high a living. Um, for someone then that waited until age 70 to start collecting, the amount is about $2,300 a month. Again, it's going to be enough to pay your rent, buy your food, eh, not much more. Um, but that's fine because you don't have to worry about where's how am I going to pay the rent or how am I going to buy the food. You know you're going to be able to cover that with um, Social Security, which is also generally not going to be taxed at the same rate at which general income is. Um, <coughs> the government will, to determine the amount you're going to get paid, it looks at your AIME. This would be the average of your 35 highest years. So this obviously works to the disadvantage of um, let's say a, a single parent um, where that parent may have had to take time off to raise a child. So 35 years, you know, um, just, you know, looking at even what my mother's was most recently, she has a number of years where the income was zero. Um, so she had to actually had to work a little bit longer to replace some of those zero years. So there is a little bit of a gender fairness issue. It's not that fair um, in that calculation. Okay. So again, Social Security hasn't changed <coughs> that much. Um, the, I guess the other thing to kind of talk about here with Social Security is the way that it works with the Medicare program. Medicare, you can start collecting at age 65. Um, the very first person to collect Social Security was a woman named Ida Fuller. Ida Fuller. Oh. She paid... Um, I don't remember exactly what the... I, we got to look up the famous example of Ida Fuller. Probably has a wiki page. Yep. And she does. She paid into the system $24.75. Is that, yeah? $24.75 into the system. She was the first person to ever collect Social Security. And she lived until... Um, 100 years old. And she collected, after putting $22.54 into the program, she collected $22,888 over her lifetime. After putting in $24.75, she got $22.54 a month. Now, this is pretty extreme. After the first month, she basically had almost gotten back all that she had put into the program. But this caring, grandmotherly looking woman, right? I mean, that's exactly, that's great PR right there, right? Um, who doesn't like Ida Fuller, right? <laughs> um, poor old woman. Um, most individuals uh, within about two years to three years make back all of their contributions. So, it is a program that most people do benefit from more than what they um, put into the system. 
Now, why, again, do we do this? Just like we did for Head Start when we talked about it, there are externalities. The externalities would be is that if you are in a poverty situation, um, there's nothing to save. If, the, if you don't have the income, there's nothing to save to get out of this problem. And so the idea is that, again, there is that cycle of poverty. The only way to get out of that cycle of poverty is to have some system that can be more generously designed to help the poor get out of the situation that they're in. Um, don't worry about this part here. Um, the concern with this is that the Social Security Trust Fund is running out of money. Um, it holds, there is a file cabinet in West Virginia that holds this trust fund. There's a famous picture here. It's basically a locked file cabinet in um, Parkersburg, West Virginia. And so you see here Clinton the, or Bush the second looking at these, basically this U.S. Treasury debt that Social Security Administration holds. Um, the Bush administration, this is before 9-11, the Bush administration wanted to get rid or wanted to allow the trust fund to start to invest in like stocks and bonds. Well, after September 11th and the stock market crash after that, he got he dropped that plan. But the idea was that the trust fund is pretty quickly running out of money. In fact, it will run out of money here in um, less than 10 years. Um, but even if nothing changes, even if the trust fund runs out of money and no further appropriations are provided by the federal government, the government will still be able to pay about 80% what is promised. So I don't oftentimes make these kinds of promises, but Social Security will be there when you retire, even if you're a 20 year old or something in this class, it will be there. It might not be as generous as you were promised, but something will be there. And remember, this program isn't paying just for you in old age, but also if something happens to you and you become disabled and you are unable to work, it provides for you, your spouse, and your dependents. It is demographics that's largely to blame um, for the social security system running out of money. Um, the fact of the matter is that there are just fewer workers um, per retiree. And so what we kind of have to, to think about as we're trying to think about how do we fix this problem is how do we get um, more out of the system? There's a number of, um, I've already talked about this insolvency here, so I'm just going to um, skip over this. There's a number of ways that we can think about trying to fix the Social Security system. Those ideas include um, raising taxes. So um, not only increasing the 6% tax rate, but also only your first, I think it's $120,000 of income as an individual is taxed um, for Social Security. So, you know, the um, Elon Musk's of the world that are earning lots of income, they only pay Social Security taxes on that first hundred some thousand dollars. Um, raising the retirement age further, that's a little bit difficult because for a lot of individuals, it's just the body gets worn down by the late 60s. So raising the retirement age is a pretty um, difficult way of, to save Social Security. Um, something that would also be a bit more controversial would be um, having a means test. So a means test means that you have to have you have to have a certain amount of poverty before you are eligible for Social Security. Mm, I mean, the, one of the beauties of the Social Security program is that it is available to everyone. And it is supposed to be for everyone. Again, one of those three legs. Even for myself as a state employee, 
I obviously have a traditional pension. I try to save for retirement through um, state employees. So we have a 403B, which is like a 401k. And Social Security is that third leg. Um, and then you start even getting into crazier things like investing the trust fund in stocks and bonds or letting people invest it themselves. Um, you're starting to get into some pretty dangerous things. And again, these were all talked about in 2000, 2001. But after the 2001 um, slight recession that we had, as well as the September 11th attacks, most of this discussion was taken off the table. And we really haven't talked about it since. So we get another video, which again, helps us understand the, the um, understanding of the system. Also a documentary. An old. Oh, geez, there's lots of videos here. It's a really old one. Mm, don't want the disability benefits one. Mm, I can be able to find it if I don't know the name. And I don't remember the name. Could be this. Let's see. Yeah, it is. Okay. So, again, just like the Head Start film, um, I'll talk a little bit about this. So, this used to be um, the government's got more complicated census. So um, sometimes you may not see it as um, on your paycheck. You may not see it as Social Security. It may be written as OASDI, which is a way of saying old age and survivor's disability insurance. So it is insurance, Social Security insurance. It's not a welfare program. It is something we all pay into. So again, on your paycheck, you may see it as OASDI which stands for old age survivors. And then disability insurance was added in the 1960s. man right so again idea elderly poverty rampant uh, before the social security program when they reached old age they found themselves lacking the means to meet even their barest needs and so they were forced to become wards of public charity denied the dignity of a happy, earned security. Their declining years became a period of hopeless waiting. Alone, the 
these people could not work out the picture of a happy old age. Something had to be done. Something was done. So there you go. There is the signing of the... Um, there's the signing of the um, Social Security bill by Franklin Roosevelt, and you can see... Um, <laughs> I don't know why there's music playing right now. Um, but you also see this. Um, I don't know why it really wants to play music here. Um, but you're seeing this. Um, sorry, I'm not sure why my stereo is playing here. The mic's off. The mic's back. The mic's off. There we go. Um you see here, um, Franklin Roosevelt also had a um, female um, Secretary of Labor, and she was also part of the push for um, having the Social Security program exist. In 1935, Franklin D. Roosevelt put his signature on the Social Security Act. This Social Security measure gives at least some protection to 30 millions of our citizens who will reap direct benefit through unemployment compensation, through old age pensions, and through increased services for the protection of children and the prevention of ill health. Then, 15 years later, Congress passed a new Social Security law, a law designed to meet today's needs. Signed by President Truman in 1950, this act gives Social Security a new meaning for you. So it starts in 1935 with Franklin Roosevelt and then is expanded under the Truman administration. Um, just kind of how um, similar to when we looked at um, the Medicare program started with Truman and then you really get it with um, the Johnson administration. So you do see this kind of chain of events where presidents can't do it all in their term, but then that torch is kind of passed to another president. And so today, this is the portrait of the future, a picture which Social Security helped make possible. Under the Social Security Act, most American families are now able to insure for themselves an income that is guaranteed for life. It's an income provided not by charity or relief, but by federal old age and survivor's insurance. So the idea there was that this was a time when um, individuals were quite reluctant to take any kind of handouts from the government. So by saying that it was insurance, you were insuring that um, uh, people wouldn't feel like they're um, having to accept the handout. Insurance that is bought and paid for. Here's how it works. Old age and survivor's insurance is earned by most of us because most jobs are now covered by the Social Security Act. After working about a year and a half, you become insured for the next year and a half. Again, structure's now different. Um, you work for um, um, 10 years, and then you get um, insurance for life. Um, this is kind of more in the transition period when Social Security is kind of just starting. From then on, you're insured for an additional year for each six months that you work. At the end of 10 years of work, you are insured for the rest of your life. Now that part does um, exist. Uh, unfortunately, again, you don't get the, um, if you work less than 10 years, uh, you really don't have insurance for any time period. You really have to work the 10 years to have insurance for life. A special provision in the law makes it easier for people already past middle age to become insured. The amount of work they need depends on how soon they'll reach 65. And if you're nearing 65, or if you've already passed that age, you may need as little as a year and a half of work performed at any time since 1936 to become insured for life. Contributions based on your earnings made regularly by you and millions of your fellow workers, plus equal contributions made by your employers pay for the program. These contributions are collected by the federal government. All right, and so there's the idea. 
It's that the government really is at least trying to say here, we don't really have a role in actually funding it. We're just collecting the money from you and your employer, and then we'll pay out the benefit, the, the government will pay out those benefits. The government then holds them in trust for payment of benefits to you and your family. And that is that file cabinet we saw that's in West Virginia. When these benefits become due, the government guarantees regular monthly payments. Payments begin whenever you retire after you're 65 or after you're 75, even if you keep on working. They continue as long as you live. After your death, payments continue. Mm, I'm guessing there the husband died, uh, but it is true. Um, you can actually work while collecting Social Security up to a certain amount. It's about eighteen or nineteen thousand dollars. After you earn about that amount of money, um, Social Security does get then reduced about fifty cents for every dollar that you earn. To your wife, if she is over sixty-five. If you should die while your children are under eighteen, payments will go to your wife and children, no matter what your age was. Uh, so that is that's the survivors part of OASDI. Uh, <laughs> So, for instance, if I died tomorrow in a car accident, um, my children and my wife would receive a payment from Social Security um, designed to replace some portion of the income um, that comes from me not long, no longer existing anymore. Um, and that would cover uh, my children until they earn 18. Um, and um, yes. have no family and we're supporting your parents monthly payments will be made to them when they reach 65. Mm, that's not true anymore federal old age and survivors insurance is exactly what the name implies it is insurance that you and your employer have bought and paid for this insurance is important not only to you it's important to your wife your children your parents and it's important to your employer who helps pay the premiums. Who is covered by the Social Security Act? People like these. Most people who work for themselves and most people who work for others. 45 million jobs are covered by Social And this is largely true. Almost every job is covered under the Social Security system. Social Security. And the chances are that you will work in one of them. That's why it's vitally important that you fully understand the Social Security Act. And that's why across the nation, hundreds of Social Security field offices have been set up to serve you. The duty of every person in these field offices, managers, receptionists, field representatives, and claims assistants like Margaret Oliver, is to give you the greatest possible service and assistance. Since January 1951, a lot of people coming into field offices are workers whose jobs are covered under the new act. Here they take a momentous step, applying for Social Security cards. Naturally, many have questions. It's the claims assistance job to know the answers. Tom Reynolds here is self-employed, and like almost 5 million others who own their own trades or businesses, he is covered by the new Social Security law. Okay, so, right, so we're just going through all the different careers and professions. I just want to kind of fast forward this here to the sort of to the end here. Or parent. This claim is notice to the government that payments are due you. Serving this notice is your responsibility. Your social security card represents an insurance policy. Oh, dude, we totally found out that person's social security number. Look at that. Policy. A policy through which you can build a foundation of security for yourself and your family. As a person who is buying and paying for this insurance, or as a beneficiary, you are entitled to information, guidance, and service in all matters that concern it. That service is available to you without charge, behind doors like these. 
doors to more than 500 field offices throughout the nation. Behind those doors, you will find men and women like these, carefully selected and thoroughly trained, people working for you, like Margaret Oliver, helping you get the most. Uh, so the part, out of your... part we missed here right is after just talking about Social Security field offices. We have one here in Kapolei. Um, I've been inside it. Pretty respectable. Um, um, I've actually taken um, students that actually have an issue with Social Security. Or you can bring anyone you want. And so if you ever do have a Social Security issue and you just want a person there who, you know, kind of knows about the system and just can help you kind of understand things, dude, I am an email away. I will happily accompany you if you ever have to go to a Social Security appointment um, just to have someone there. You're allowed to bring someone with you. Social Security. Okay, so that ends um, our discussion of Social Security. It also ends our discussion of poverty-based programs. So hopefully um, I'll get off my high horse about the role that the government has in poverty reduction and elimination. If you don't believe that the government has a role, then this week's lectures have been incredibly annoying to you, and I'm sorry for that. Um, but use your analysis papers to convince me that I'm wrong. I will happily read anything you write. And um, I'm not a perfect person. I truly can be wrong about things. Um, do not feel like you need to just agree with me just to agree with me. Okay.